Uh, how you doing, HTC? You know, we are um, going to start a new series um, today, and I'll get into that in a minute. But I want you to pray about something. Something different is going on. We've been extremely busy. Some people have wondered what pastors do, especially... Um, <laughs> Some people wonder that all the time, but especially during COVID, we're having more conversations and more meetings and more things going on, I think, than ever. But this week is a very special opportunity that uh, we as, as a church team have, and that's to host a remote conference for church leaders, the National Oikos Conference, very first time that we've done something like this. Our team has been planning this for the past couple of years. I've been invited personally over the last 10 years or so into a number of leadership conversations around the country and uh, actually in different countries around the world. Um, but this is the first time our staff team is really taking the lead, going to be joining me to provide training on the OECOS principle as it affects specific ministries um, and specific age groups. COVID has forced us to provide the event remotely uh, rather than the in-person event that we envisioned a few years ago. We actually had it all planned out to be down on the low desert in Palm Springs. But uh, we have hundreds of church leaders representing 15 different states that will be joining us remotely. And that is happening on Wednesday and Thursday. And so HCC, all I'm asking you to do, if you remember that, is to pray for us because it could have uh, ripple effects of tremendous impact in communities uh, all over the country for the sake of the gospel. In fact, we, we even have a group up in Canada gonna join us for that, so please pray for us. Okay, well 2020, what a year, right? You know, we were trying to figure out what to do between Acts. Acts was a pretty long study, about 25 weekends long. We generally don't have uh, a study, a particular series that uh, is that long, but that took a while, and I think it was a good study for us as a church family, and of course, we're looking forward to um, the Christmas season, but in between our study of the book of Acts and our, our Christmas series, which begins um, right after Thanksgiving, we, we want to just uh, bring our church family around a couple of discussions, conversations, try to answer some questions that really are on people's minds. Since things have been so jacked up, people are asking these questions with fair consistency. For Cheryl and I, 2020 actually began um, with a broken pipe in our house, and that flooded the house. They had to tear big sections of the house apart, and it was two months that we were displaced, and we were able and glad to be able to come back into our house about a week before COVID became a thing. And that was a good thing, because little did we know at the time we would need a place to hunker down uh, for a while. And then you have COVID followed by a national battle over justice, followed by destructive hurricanes and destructive wildfires, followed by closed businesses and lost jobs and an explosive, another explosive Supreme Court justice battle. And then to top it all off, we we're looking forward to a national election that is guaranteed to depress at least 50% of our country, no matter what the outcome might be. And if I miss something, uh, you might want to write it down in the chat because we got this long list of things that we're wondering about. Could this be the end of the world? We all have more than one bad thing to say about this year. But could it be that this is the end? You know, the answer to that question is an easy one. Uh, is this the end of the world? So let me answer that for you. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Okay, is that good? Let's close in prayer. No, I'm just kidding. We'll get more. But that, we don't know. But a different question is this, this question. Are we living in the last days? And the answer to that question is also very simple. The answer is absolutely we are. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and we looked at this in our study of the book of Acts. Now, this is a long time ago because that was a long series. But in verse 17, as Peter is preaching, he says this. In the last days, God says, 
I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Peter declared that the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, was a fulfillment of the prophet Joel's prophecy. So the last days actually began when Jesus ascended to heaven and we are still living in the last days. You might call our generation the last days of the last days. But the Bible says we've all been living in the last days for over 2,000 years. Most of us would probably agree that Jesus is coming back, those of us that follow Jesus, those of us that believe the Word of God is true. And just throughout my lifetime, it seems like there have been a lot of conversations about a particular, very specific season of history being the end of the world. Every time the fireworks, you know, are lit up again in the Middle East, where the world encounters a noticeable escalation of evil somewhere, or natural disasters start, start dominating the headlines, then those same voices begin weighing in and people start arguing about the details of Christ's return. Those last days timelines, you've seen those. I've actually created a few of them in some of the opportunities I've had to teach regarding events in the last days but those timelines continue to be reworked over and over again to highlight verses that reflect the most recent events around the world. And then those same prophecy books that I read as a young man are given a new design on the cover and some of the chapters, you know, updated, and then they're sent around the horn again, and we, we read about it again. And to be honest with you, I think some of us in Christ's body have kind of given up you know, our ears have been perked so many times about this could possibly be the end that I think so many believers have just lost interest, almost like the boy who cried wolf. Remember that story. But 2020 has given us all a different sense of urgency to this conversation or trying to answer this question. People who may have excused themselves from some of the previous discussions about some of the previous global conditions seem to be emboldened now to join the fray. There's this heightened confidence in the soon return of Jesus Christ simply because so many things this year have gone sideways. Now, this guy says no. I just thought I'd show you this picture. I was taking a walk. Cheryl and I, actually, it was a few years ago on the island of Maui, and uh, I saw this van and this guy put the sign on his van and I had to take a picture of it because I was used to seeing so many signs that Jesus was coming back and bumper stickers saying Jesus is returning but this was the first time I'd ever seen anybody make that point see we all have an opinion about the return of Christ and some of your opinions or my opinions may have even changed over over the time we've been Christians but since the Bible has not changed what do the scriptures say about that question? Is this the end of the world? So I want to start with something Jesus said, book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 7. He said, look, I love that. It's kind of like how I start a lot of my conversations. Look, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. Then down in verse 12, same chapter. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I'll, I'll give to each person according to what they have done. Then down in verse 20, same chapter. He who testifies to these things says, Jesus is testifying to these things. He says, yes, I am coming soon. Okay, if Jesus is right about everything, and that's my bias, I would imagine many of you listening would share that bias. But if he is right about everything, then evidently he is coming back. Jesus said repeatedly in the Gospels that he would be returning. 
And he said it there in the book of Revelation three times in that one chapter, chapter 22. And he keeps adding that word soon, which might be a little misleading, actually. You know, if you've been around here very long, I'm a, a Bruin apologist. I'm a UCLA fan, and a lot of that is because of John Wooden and growing up a basketball fan and watching those great Bruin teams as a young man, as a, actually as a young boy. And Coach Wooden had a lot of... Um, a lot of coaching mantras or slogans or sayings that he would tell his teams. And one of them is this, be quick, but don't hurry. Be quick, but don't hurry. And what he meant was that on the basketball court, it's important not to force the issue, but to be patient and let the game come to you. But when the game does come to you and there is an opening, then respond quickly. Don't be in a hurry. But when you got the chance, be quick. See, according to Coach, quickness was a virtue, recklessness was not. In a way, that's what Jesus meant, I think, when he said he's coming soon. His return will be quick, but he's not in a hurry. See, that word soon that's repeated three times in Revelation 22, it doesn't mean, it, the word doesn't mean right away. Tako is the Greek word. And it emphasizes the idea of being prompt, being prompt without necessary delay. For example, if I told you to come taco for Christmas Eve service, I would be encouraging you to be on time for the service to be prompt, I would not necessarily be telling you to show up tomorrow for the service. Why not? Because tomorrow is not Christmas Eve. Peter, the apostle who personally had, had heard Jesus' words on multiple occasions about what his second coming would involve, uh, not just hearing Jesus teach, but actually engaging in dialogue after so many of those teaching opportunities. Peter would probably know what Jesus meant when he said he's coming soon. And when Peter ended up writing his letter, second letter, second Peter, chapter 3, verse 9, this is what Peter said. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. This is just a few decades after Jesus' first coming, after his ascension back into heaven. And Christians are already asking the question, well, where is he? We thought he was coming back. Peter said, no, he's not slow. He's not in a hurry. He's not slow as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This might be the most important thought of the day. That the reason it seems like Jesus has not yet come is because there is work that is not yet done. Understanding the Bible requires a consistent focus on God's plan to redeem the world. High Desert Church, if you want to understand any principle in the New Testament, you have to see that principle through the lens of God's plan to redeem humanity, to turn lost people into saved people. And when God's redemptive plan progresses to the point of its fulfillment, at that time, at the appropriate time, he will come back. He will be prompt. Tako simply means that no one can delay Jesus when the appointed time on his calendar has come. You see, when we look at a little chart here, you see the first advent, that's Christmas. And then you see his return, which of course is our theme today. And topic of so many conversations recently in my life, perhaps in yours. Well, from the first to the second advent, we call that period of time the church age. It's that, that period of time when Jesus said he's going to mobilize his church to reach out to people and see those who are lost in their sin redeemed by Christ. 
Now, we elevate all the time the oikos principle here because 95% of those who come to Christ actually come to Christ because of the influence of someone that is sitting in the front row seats of their lives, somebody who is in their, their oikos. And so that's the challenge Jesus gave us, to make disciples until he comes back. But it is during this period of time, the church age, that during Jesus' first advent, he would give parables, he would teach on what we could expect during the church age and leading up to his return, his second coming. And one of those sections is Matthew chapter 24, and many of you who are tracking biblical prophecy, you know that, chapter 24. I'm going to read some extended passages today with little commentary just to make sure we get through in a reasonable amount of time today, but Matthew 24, verse 1. So Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Now, like most Jews, the disciples were impressed with the temple. It was a beautiful set of buildings, the Jewish temple. In fact, it was world-renowned, one of the architectural wonders of the world. And the disciples were really impressed with it with the temple, and so they were just commenting with Jesus. Wow, it's just a beautiful set of buildings, right? Well, you can, you could say that the temple was the symbol of the Jewish establishment, and Jesus, of course, was less impressed with the religious establishment and what they represented than maybe the establishment was impressed with itself. And so Jesus said in verse 2, after the disciples said, hey, Jesus, this is beautiful, right? Jesus said, do you see all these things? Looking at the buildings. He said, truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one, every stone the temple was built was stones, and every one of those stones will be thrown down. Verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, of course, what Jesus said about the temple was a little disconcerting to them, and the disciples came to him privately, and they said, Jesus, tell us, when, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, those are two different questions you may have noticed. Not two ways of asking the same question. The two questions are these. When will the temple be destroyed? Because that is what bothered them. And then the second question is, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the church age? And so we'll just look at them in order and spend most of our time on that second one. Question number one, when will the temple be destroyed? History gives us the answer, 70 AD. The answer to that question is in about 40 years from the time that Jesus and the disciples had that discussion because that's exactly what happened in 70 AD. And a lot of believers look at this temple as a yet future temple for us, not just the disciples, but still a future temple. And uh, so they're looking forward to another temple being built um, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. There's a lot of political controversy there with Islam and Judaism and the Temple Mount. And uh, you can look at that on your own time. But anyway, they think Many think, many believers think, another temple will be built. And so we're still looking forward, in their opinion, to this prophetic word being, being fulfilled. And if that temple is built again, they would say it will be dismantled again like it was in 70 A.D. And, and there's nothing wrong with having that opinion. A big part of the Christian family believes that. I know Orthodox Judaism would love to build another temple, not to see it destroyed, but at least to have another temple. But what Jesus said about the temple being dismantled has already happened once, and we just have to recognize that. Again, about 40 years after the conversation he had with the disciples, and the destruction was pretty thorough. And the destruction of the temple in 70 AD did not happen in a vacuum. And let me just give you a little bit of context. There was a group of zealots, Jewish zealots, uh, who attacked a Roman fortress on a big rock overlooking, overlooking the Dead Sea, a rock called Masada. I've actually been to Masada. I know many of you have as well on some of those trips that 
Uh, maybe we've even sponsored through High Desert Church. But it's a magnificent uh, set of ruins, and you can only imagine um, it was built uh, for royalty and was a beautiful uh, set, of, set of buildings and impregnable to enemy forces. You could see how easy it would be to defend. But anyway, this group of zealots attack the Roman defenses, top of the rock, and the miracle is somehow they won. And so the temple captain in Jerusalem showed solidarity with this attack by stopping the daily sacrifices there in Jerusalem in the temple to Caesar. Because remember, Jerusalem was under Roman rule. And then more dominoes began to fall and the Jewish people became more and more emboldened to start killing and expelling Rome, Romans from Israel. And that led to a pretty severe retaliation by the Roman army, a six-month siege against Jerusalem, against a very resilient group of Jewish defenders. And by the time the Roman army finally broke through the walls around the city of Jerusalem, the Romans had become so enraged by the stubbornness of the rebellion that they obliterated the temple. And then they turned their sights on Masada. They had a difficult time taking control once again of that fortress. But they finally summited the rock, and when they did, it's a pretty famous story how they found all of the Jew Jewish defenders. They had taken their own lives rather than surrendering to Rome in the Roman army. But this is the question. Was Jesus' prediction of the temple's destruction fulfilled to the letter? Remember what he said. No stone will be left on top of another. Well, a Jewish historian named Josephus, writing in the first century and actually walking among the ruins of the temple and the ruins of Jerusalem, said that Jesus' prophecy was actually fulfilled to the letter. But if you don't believe Josephus, you can go there yourself because you won't even find a stone from that temple on the Temple Mount today. But Jesus said that the destruction of the Jewish temple that initiated this conversation with the disciples, that was not the only crisis his followers would have to monitor when? During the church age. Verse 4, that same chapter, Matthew 24, Jesus continued. He said, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and, and many of those people will, dece will deceive you. Verse 6, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pangs. And then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith, will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And then Luke, in, in his gospel account, he includes this from what Jesus said that day. And I include it in our consideration for this presentation because it adds a word that a lot of people are talking about right now. And you'll know what word I'm referring to pretty quickly. In Luke chapter 21, verse 11, Jesus said there will be great earthquakes, famines, and then Luke adds the word pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Well, keep in mind, HDC, these things are characteristic of the church age, but also keep in mind, they are not necessarily signs that things are going to end in the next few months. Jesus said the things on the list don't reference the very end. He said that. But they occur throughout these last days, also known, a.k.a. the church age. And the list is, I mean, it's pretty long what Jesus said. There'll be deceivers. There'll be wars and rumors of them. There'll be famines and earthquakes. There'll be pestilences and persecution, apostasy, increasing evil, 
and, and faithful witnesses. There will be some who will make it to the very end. And you and I may not all share the same views of Jesus' return because I know even in our own church family there are a lot of different opinions about what that looks like, what the events associated with it will look like. But I want you to know if you don't have the same view as me or even the same views as each other, it's okay. You don't have to take on the responsibility of making sure that all of Christianity agrees with you. It's okay that pastors and parishioners have different opinions about a lot of things. This week I was in a discussion with a guy on a completely different topic and he said that his view was the only one that had any merit. And I challenged that, not his view, just the fact that one opinion would be the only one with merit. Here's one of the most basic rules for the Christian faith. So get ready. When we don't agree with each other, we still pray for, we still love, and we still encourage one another, even in the midst of sharing our differences. But we have to be very careful. And this is one of those topics where we have to be very careful about. The Bible calls out individuals who publicly agitate to stir the pot and create dissension. In fact, in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul said, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. And I know public slander seems to be the purpose for social media sometimes. But we should never use it to further divide an already divided church. So whatever your view about the return of Christ is, hold that view. Study the word. Ask God to confirm it or change it. But just recognize there are some pretty smart people that don't agree with you, who are filled with the exact same Holy Spirit, who love God just as much as you do. But regardless of what your eschatological view might be, Jesus is telling all of us, regardless of the difficulties we face during the last days, Jesus said, keep on keeping on, no matter how hard it gets. Once again, as a basketball fan, we're looking forward to maybe having March Madness next year. And those of us who look forward to that national tournament, we hear a, we hear a, a particular phrase an awful lot, survive and advance. It's a single elimination tournament. Just find a way to survive. Find a way to win the game because if you do, you get to advance. And in life, that's required of all of us. No matter the challenges we face, we need to figure it out and keep moving forward with the gospel as the primary purpose for moving anywhere. You see that second question, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the church age? The answer to that is pretty simple. When God's plan to redeem the world is fulfilled. See, if the things that are on that list we looked at a minute ago are not so much signs of your coming, Lord, which Jesus seemed to indicate, but they are simply things to expect while we wait for the end of come. Jesus, is there a particular sign we should watch for? And Jesus said in that passage, now verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Church, this is the sign of Christ's return. This is the sign of the end of the church age the fulfillment of God's plan to redeem the world from their sin. Those nations, the gospel of the kingdom be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. When Jesus used that word, he was not referring to what we think of when we consider modern nations with capitals and borders and budgets. Jesus is referring to the ethnos, a Greek word that simply means peoples, Groups of individuals who are characterized by similar cultures or settings or languages or traditions. 
And there's only one way to watch for a sign like that. This is going to be the sign of Christ's return. And how do you watch for a sign like the one Jesus gave us? Only one way. Pursue it. There's no way for us to know when that statement will be fulfilled, when the gospel will have been finally preached to the point where God's plan has been fulfilled. We don't know when that is. All we can do is what? Show up every day and pursue that goal. But once the gospel is shared to that extent, a line that only God knows, when history crosses that line, only God knows. But when it happens, you know what Jesus said? I'm not going to dilly-dally around, bro. At that point, he's going to be quick. He'll be as anxious as anyone to wrap it up. No more delay. At that point, we will see Jesus when? Taco, soon. But in the meantime, we're in a fight. In the meantime, we're in a firefight. And I'm not talking about the political fight we're witnessing, although we could certainly say we're in one of those, right? I'm not talking about a cultural fight we're in the middle of, although we could say that as well, but we are in a spiritual fight to redeem the world from sin, to see lost people become saved people, and it's more than a fight. It's a war, and it has a lot of soldiers. That's us, but there's only one commander, and that's Jesus. See, fill in that blank. Lots of soldiers, one commander. In fact, when Paul wrote the Ephesian letter from his Roman prison cell, he said, put on the full armor of God. He's probably sitting there looking at Roman soldiers, and as the Holy Spirit moves in his heart, God wants him to write down how much our experience in this spiritual war that we find ourselves in looks like a Roman soldier's equipment and the need for us to appropriate full combat here full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes because our struggle is a spiritual struggle. It's against spiritual rulers, spiritual authorities, against the powers of this dark world, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's no sense pretending anymore. We all woke up this morning behind enemy lines. And friends, our citizenship is not here. There's so many allusions to this reality in, in both what Jesus taught in the Gospels and what the apostles wrote in their letters. We, we are not citizens here. We've been deployed here to fight on behalf of our king, to fight for God's people, to secure their liberation from the bondage of sin. And that's why we can't get comfortable here. We can't feel like we're going to be here forever because we're not. War is hell. And when it comes to this one, this is a big one. In fact, to all of you who gave your heart to Jesus recently and we were able to watch so many of you baptized on that video a little while ago, Congratulations, by the way. But when somebody comes into the family of God, we simply say to them, welcome to the war. Number two, lots of opinions, but only one commission. And it's the great commission I'm referring to. You see, Jesus' promise of his second advent was, was delivered to us. His promise was given to us to bring the body of Christ together, not to divide us over the details. It was supposed to help us lock arms together and pursue the global perpetuation of, of the good news of the gospel. And oftentimes Christians choose to waste their lives on themselves. But God calls us all to rally around this incredibly important mission that we all share, that we've been deployed to fulfill so maybe it's time for us to get busy. 
and not be so bossy. <laughs> Get busy, not bossy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. I mean, it was only a few decades after his first advent, just a few decades after his ascension of the Father, and Christians were already arguing about his second coming. The Bible simply doesn't tell us everything we'd like to know about the future. And the more we insist on filling in the blanks, the more we are likely to be wrong anyway. But rather than come together as one body of Christ with that singular agenda to redeem humanity from sin, to see lost people become saved people, the singular sign of the return of Christ, we have pursued our own agendas. That's why there are 33,000 different iterations of Christianity around the world today. And we're all arguing about the details of Christ's return. And we're arguing about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we're arguing about women in ministry and their role in leadership. And we're arguing about opening up church buildings during COVID. And we're arguing about the security of the believer. Folks, there are a lot of arguments out there. And Jesus repeatedly warned us about this war. On more than one occasion, in more than one of his parables, he painted a picture of the church age. In Matthew, same book, chapter 13, verse 24, he gives us a heads up about something that I want to end with because I want you all to get this. He says in verse 24, Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now remember again, we're talking about the church age the period of time between the first and second advent of Christ. He continues, verse 25, but while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And when the weeds sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to him and said, sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where do the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied, and the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, listen, church, this is a great lesson. While you're focused on pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat. While you're focused on the evil in the world, you are actually in danger of ruining the harvest. Let both grow together until the harvest, verse 30. And at that time, I'll tell the harvesters, collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned, and then gather the weed and bring it into my barn. And then after that, Jesus gave two more parables. And I'm not saying the disciples didn't want to know about mustard seeds or didn't want to know about bacon bread, but later on, it was that parable of the weeds and the wheat that they had questions about. And so in verse 36, it says, he left the crowd, went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, would you please explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field? Because that one really bothered, bothered us. And since it bothered them, maybe, maybe it should bother us. Since they wanted an answer as to what it meant, maybe we should look at the answer that Jesus now gives. In verse 37, the one who sowed the good seed is Jesus, son of man. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the people of the kingdom, the weeds of the people of the evil one. The enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The harvesters are angels. And as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it'll be that way when? At the end of the age, the Son of Man will send out his angels. He'll weed out all uh, out of his kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil, and they'll throw them into the blazing furnace where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. I don't know who you may be listening to this service with in the room. Y'all are sitting in, but just look around. Anybody there have ears? How about you? This is Jesus' way of saying, listen up, church. And brings us to number three. There are a lot of weeds, but what matters most is the wheat. There are a lot of weeds out there. 
but God is interested in the wheat. You see, wheat was an important crop in Palestine, growing all over Israel. And a particular type of weed was also very common. It was called, it is called now, the bearded darnel. And it's a poisonous ryegrass. And when it first starts to develop, when it first sprouts up, it looks just like wheat. In fact, in some places, it's actually called false wheat. But as soon as the grain begins to form ahead, the difference becomes obvious. And by that time, when the farmer actually could tell the difference between a weed and the wheat. Both had grown so close to one another that removing the weed potentially damaged the crop. And that's why a clear separation didn't occur until the end of the harvest. See, what matters most is the harvest. This is what Jesus is telling us. God has the mindset of a farmer. And if you've ever asked a farmer how much the harvest matters to their mission, to his or her mission as a farmer, they'll clarify it for you. The harvest is their mission. Without a harvest this year, they don't have a farm next year. And that's the point here. Focus on the harvest. When asked what the sign of his second coming would be, Jesus said, when the harvest is complete. We should fully expect that Christ's church, you and me, our ministry, primarily to those sitting in our front row seats, that that ministry will thrive in the midst of this escalation of evil all around us. And church, I know it's happening. I know what you worry about. I know what you fear because we all have those fears. Look at how evil the world has become. Jesus knew that. He told us before the church age even began that you're going to have a lot of weeds. They're going to become so entrenched in what we try to accomplish as a people of God. He said, just prepare for that. But don't worry. My angels will take care of it at the end. The weeds are not your problem. The harvest is. We'll take care of the separation. We'll take care of the, the weeds. We will enjoy the ultimate harvest when all is said and done. And now, you guys, we have 2,000 years of hindsight that the disciples did not have. And if history has taught us anything, it's this. Nothing can stop the momentum of Jesus Christ building his church. He said he would. During the greatest seasons of Christian oppression, during the reigns of some of the most brutal Caesars, the church literally transformed the landscape of human civilization took over the ancient world and it continues to grow in spite sometimes of our continued efforts to make church all about us. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, so deal with it. He said, we'd be salt. We'll provide a, a moral type of preservation against corruption. Jesus said we'd be light. That is, we will bring the world a moral example of God's righteousness. But Jesus never implied that our positive influence would always be well received or that there would never be any significant opposition. He simply said the weeds will never overwhelm the wheat. So stay focused, church. Stay focused on the harvest. And let God deal with the weeds. Verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Jesus didn't say that evil will reach a certain threshold and then the end would come. He didn't say that earthquakes would reach level 9 on the Richter scale and then the end would come. He said that when the gospel is sufficiently preached, then the end would come. That's what we're about. And the only thing we can do with that sign is to pursue it. Jesus said that while the battle will go on until the end of time, and all those difficulties that we listed will be characteristic of the church age. 
always expect the glory of what's right to always outshine, to always outlast the story of what went wrong. Jesus said, I tell you, open your eyes, man. And look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. I know it's so easy to get locked into cable news, television, and just be overwhelmed with those consistent, that bombardment of focus on what's wrong. And my challenge would be for you to take out your Oikos card and spend more time on your knees for those 8 to 15 people whom God has supernaturally and strategically placed in your life. If you spend as much time praying for them as you spent listening to all the problems out there, we'd be able to see the wheat. Rather than always looking at the weeds, but Jesus said you have to look for it, just open your eyes. And if you take your eyes off the harvest, you're going to lose your way. So while 2020 may be a year we'd like to forget for a lot of reasons, there are even more reasons we should be willing to embrace this season. Because the harvest has always been out there, but the potential harvest today is greater than ever. You just have to what? Open your eyes. And Father, I pray that you'd give us a, a sense of what you could accomplish in us if we were focused on the right things. Lord, help us to see the wheat. Help us to just lift our heads and look around us at the opportunities that we have. And, and Lord, would your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven? Would your people follow your uh, example and even pursue your challenge, fulfill your commission to see the lost know Christ. Everybody's head bowed, wherever you are, wherever you are in that room. You're sitting there with your family, maybe with your friends, maybe you're all by yourself. Just pray because there are people today watching, listening, who don't know Christ and this is their opportunity because I'm talking to them and, and that means I may be talking to you right now. God is not willing that you perish. The reason that he has not come back yet is because there are people like you he loves that he would love to see embrace Christ. Here at High Desert Church, as you know, we're all about A, B, C, admit, A, admit that you're a sinner, B, believe that Jesus came into the world to save you, and C, choose right now to place your faith in him. That could be a prayer of invitation. Lord, I admit it, I believe it, and right now I choose it. I choose Jesus. Become a wheat today by giving your heart to Christ. Become part of the harvest. Father, again, uh, would you focus us better this week than last week? And I know no one's perfect, Lord. We all get sideways a little bit. But just right now, draw us back in the line and, uh, and get us moving forward in the right direction again. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.